Good afternoon, and um, I'm going to be talking today about um, data management and data management plans. Um, this is a workshop for the postdocs at um, Baylor. So I wanted to sort of get an overview of what type of postdocs there might be, because I know we have them in the humanities and in the social sciences and in the sciences, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have we have pretty broad representation across. You know, of course, most of them are concentrated in STEM fields. Okay. But uh, but yes, we do also have some folks in the humanities, um, English, okay. history, uh, those types of things. Uh, and, and a lot of those folks do more teaching. They're not a research focus post of the folks in STEM. Okay. But uh, so there's okay. a variety of types. There's still grants and stuff that they yes. have. So especially if they're into digital humanities. So um. So the frame that we're going to use for today is um, the research data life cycle. Um, and so the, there's lots of research data life cycles. And the one that I'm going to be using today um, is this one. And it comes from um, the UK um, the UK data service. And I like this one because it's relatively simple. Um, and all the steps sort of make sense. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go through the different steps um, and then we'll pop out um, when needed to look at some other websites. So um, we'll start off with finding research. So planning research involves figuring out your research plan. Um, it also includes data management. So planning your data management or creating a data management plan. Um, if you're in the social sciences, um, a consent for sharing, sometimes um, you know your IRB and all of that. Um, and then figure out how you're gonna collect data, um, what you're gonna do with the data, um, and then maybe also looking for existing data sources. So a lot of uh, researchers do do secondary research, uh, data research. So let's say the government, um, you know, census data or um, different other data that might already exist from really large surveys that you might um, reanalyze. So you guys are postdocs, so I assume you already know what a research plan is, um, but I just wanted to point this out because we'll sort of come back to this. Um, when you're researching or setting out your, your plan, um, you have different methods that you might use. So you might do a reanalysis or a meta-analysis. You might have observational, experimental, or you might have a simulation, it might be theory. Um, and each of these methods have particular techniques that you might use, right? So um, running a, an NMR is sort of a, a experimental or analytical tool um, for in a lab, uh, programming something in Python um, might be for um, a simulation or for a uh, looking at theory, running a Western Black, conducting a survey, mapping and geo maps and Google Maps, um, running a sentiment analysis. So these are also techniques that might fall under one of the, sort of the research methods. Um, and so the, the other thing I wanna talk about is data management plans. So data management plans, um, they should be sort of a roadmap or a strategic plan um, and is a living document. So as your research evolves, you should make sure to update your data management plans. Um, if you apply for grants, they are expecting you when you turn in your sort of annual report at the end of the year to also update your data management plan. Um, so these are some uh, requirements uh, for data management plans. So the first one is from um, the NSF. Um, the IMLS also uses that. Uh, the second one is from the National Endowment for Humanities. Um, NIH also um, has um, sort, of, sort of different things that should be in their data management plans. Um, so now these are called data sharing plans. Um, so generally, you need to talk about what the outputs of your research are, the products of your, your research. Um, the formats is important. Um, who is going to be able to access this? This is both during uh, the data collection and data analysis and afterwards. Um, so policies for use is more for afterwards. Um, archiving, data storage, data pres preservation, where are you going to be keeping it while you're collecting the data during the project and where you're going to um, 
keep it after the project is done. Um, and also like who's in charge <laughs> of the data. This is usually the PI, but not always. So we do have a tool that's called the DNP tools. I'm gonna to do a quick demo of this. Um, you should all be able to see the DMP tool. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and log in. Um, Baylor do, does have an, uh, a subscription to it. So I'm going to go ahead and use my Baylor email. And so now I have to duo in. Oh, apparently I'm already duoed in. Um, but normally you would have to do a win. Um, so just to let you know, um, I do have admin status on this, so it's, mine is going to look slightly different um, than yours. But what we do is we just go to create a plan. Um, well, let me just show you. So we have public plans up here. So if you want to look at some examples, um, the one thing I wanted to sh show you is this DMP ID. So DMPs can get ID numbers. This ID number is given to the granting agency. Um, it should also be included um, when you write articles. So the whole idea is that everything should be linked up together. There's are called permanent identifiers or PIDs. And so Baylor has a number um, through, it's called a ROAR number and your funders have a number and um, each of the objects that your books will have ISBNs and your articles will have DOIs and your data sets will have DOIs and your DMPs have DMPs. PIDs and you have an ORCID and all of this is supposed to be connected so that the data goes straight from one to the other and you just, just go to each of the things and click and you can get to all the other information about the person or the institute, institution um, or the research. Um, so just know that you can see examples here, but they are not vetted for quality. So um, but we'll go back. Um, you also can look at the different funder requirements that they have sort of included templates for. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and create a plan. And so I'm gonna create a test plan. Um, and it's nice, they have a box for, um, for tests. Your primary research organization was Baylor because I logged in as Bay uh, using a Baylor um, email, it's automatically going to put that. And then um, a different funding agency. So is there any particular funding agency you want me to use? NSF, NSF, NSF probably good. Okay, so we do just... NSF, because um, each of the different units um, has a different template, we can pick a different template. So these are all the different templates they have. Um, so there's the generic one, um, I don't know, what do you want to pick? Doesn't really matter. But biological science. Biological science. Okay. And then we can create a plan. So then you'll have, you can change your, your title. You should put it in an abstract that helps if the person who's reviewing it. Um, and then the domain. So since we pick biological sciences as pick biological sciences, project start, start end date, that's optional. Um, NSF, the funding status. So this could be uh, planned um, and then the grant number. And you do have to save each page. Um, the other thing is that you have a uh, guidance here. So Baylor's automatically um, set, but I'm gonna go ahead and pick a couple other ones. Um, so I'm gonna pick um, uh, Texas a and Texas State and UT Austin. Um, all of these institutions use the same repository as we do. So it's, sometimes it's helpful to have their information. Because the Baylor one, it's mostly done, but we still have to do some tweaking. Okay, so then you can add your collaborators. And so you can just put in an email and then you can select a role, either a data manager, a PI, a project administrator, or other. Um, and so depending on the role, depends on what they can do to and edit. Um, so, and it's also good for yourself. Um, to put in your ORCID ID, okay? So um, I think my ORCID's already 
tied to my account. So, um, and then you can add just, so those are project con contributors. Um, so these are on your team and then you can invite collaborators and these collaborators would just be for the DMP or the data management plan. So if you wanted me to um, be able to read it, you could add it here or you could just, um, we've actually set it up where you can just ask us, um, there's two librarians who would read the data management plans and you can ask us to review it. So, um, then you write your plan. And so this is based on the template uh, provided by the NSF. So it'll put in all the um, parts that you need. So this is what you're supposed to do. So you describe, um, there's be different guidance. So there's guidance from the NSF since we're using an NSF template. Um, there's guidance from DMP tool. Um, and then there's guidance from, from Baylor. And it will sort of say, this is the types of information that you would put in here. Um, so I like to talk about your raw data, your reduced data, and your analyzed data. Uh, so your raw data is what's dumped onto your computer when you collect your data. So this might be the Excel spreadsheet that you download from Qualtrics. It might be something that's spit out from um, an analytical um, piece of equipment in your lab. Uh, and generally, people do not share their raw data because it needs to... <laughs> usually be reduced or processed in some way. So you might have to take out identifying information and put, you know, sort of ra um, random identifiers. Um, you generally need to clean up data because maybe you don't know what the units are or, um, and so your reduced or your processed data is often shared, but not necessarily. And then your analyzed data, this is the data that's produced after you've analyzed it. So generally, these are the data that produce the graphs and the tables that go into your publications. And this is almost always shared, okay? Um, as a sort of data librarian, I try and encourage people to share the reduced or the processed data because that's the data that other people can use um, um, to re- you know, reanalyze or reuse, um, you know, maybe they're interested in a different problem that your data can answer, okay? Um, they usually can't do that from your analyzed data. And so you just write the different sections. Um, so there's not, they don't like boilerplate, like, all data management plans should address the project that they're written for, but they're sometimes they're okay with um, certain um, information. For instance, we have a repository uh, that's called Bear Data, and we do have sample lang sample language just about Bear Data. Um, and if you reuse that, they're usually okay with that because um, you know it's the information that tells them what they need. But the props that are about your project should all be sort of original because bare data is not changing or if it changes, we'll change the description um, here. And then research outputs. So you can add different kinds of research outputs. Um, so it would be a data set, a data paper, maybe you're producing software, um, or an interactive resource. So maybe you, you're going to produce a Power BI um, visualization. So all of that can go here. And the metadata or the information um, will be different. Um, the options are different depending on what you pick. So let's just pick a data set. Um, it will ask you if it can contain sensitive um, or personal identifiable information. So sensitive data might be if you're doing research on an extinct, uh, a species that might be going um, extinct. You don't want poachers to be able to sort of find out where you found um, a different animals. Um, um, there might be culturally sensitive things also. Um, so sensitive data is sort of a broader category. Um, you can add in a metadata standard. Um, you can add in a repository. So the repository, uh, that Baylor has as part of the Texas data repository. So we just type in Texas. 
Um, and so you can just select the Texas data repository. Um, we call our section of it very um, very data. Um, and then just sort of when you, whether you have um, unrestricted or controlled access or other, um, and you can also pick different licenses. Um, usually you want just a, a CCO or a CC BY. So CCO means it's basically in the public domain. Um, CC BY means that they have to attribute you, attribute the data to you. Um, so this is the request feedback. So if you request feedback, then um, our team will review it, um, give us at least three business days. Um, I think we technically asked for seven business days, um, but it, we will try and get it in um, as fast as we can. And so we'll put comments in and you'll see here on the right plan that there is a section for comments. So we might just add comments here. Um, we might print it out um, in a Word file and, and send it to you that way. It, it just depends. Um, and then you can finalize it so you can make it visible to anyone, um, to just people in your organization um, or just the people that you've, you've picked. Um, and so as admin, I do get to sort of see all of the plans that used a Baylor email. So, and then if you want to register for a plan, you can. So um, it has to be at least 50% done, uh, down, done. And then you can download it as either a PDF um, or Word doc or any of these other things um, to include in your grant application. So that's just sort of a quick overview of DMP tool. Um, and if you need help with it, you can just um, click here and it will email the team. So that's sort of um, the gist of planning. So collecting data. <clears throat> collecting data, for me, this is the, the fun part. Um, the most important thing with collecting data is make sure you capture the data with the metadata. So you don't just collect the data. You need to remember to collect all the conditions that the data was collected with, right? Um, knowing what, or maybe the temperature and um, the pressure are the metadata, the information that accompanies your data. Otherwise, it, it won't make any sense. Okay. Um, so remember I talked about like the different research methods. Um, so you can also have different kinds of data outputs. And the information that you need for each, or the metadata that you need for each output is going to depend on what it is. So um, you might have videos. You might have blood samples. You might have computer programs, field notebooks. Um, graphs and spectra. Um, so these might be physical specimens, they might be paper, and they might be electronic files. So in general, the data management plans um, and people are most interested in the, in the electronic files, but I was trained as a geophysicist, uh, which is sort of a subfield of geology. And so we have physical specimens. And so I always like, don't forget about the rocks mm -hmm. um, and where the rocks are and um, like when we bring back a rock, it's very important to know like where we got the rock from and the orientation, because otherwise we can't do our analysis uh, properly. So I'm going to go a little bit more into how we organize these electronic files. So um, I have to admit, my desktop looks a little bit like this right now. Uh, it's not the best um, way to organize files. That's not generally the files I need to access. Usually it's just the temporary files that I go through and delete them. So there's two ways you can sort of order, uh, organize your files in folders. So one of them we call sort of piling, that's a flat folder structure. And the other one's filing where you have sort of nested folders. Um, so in a flat folder, all the studies are the same. 
Um, and so you're going to need descriptive um, names for your folder so that you know which study is which study. And you can't just have poster because then you have to know poster for what study and for what conference, right? Because you might present it more than once. Um, I think most people probably, um, and my picture, um, probably sort of do a filing or, or a hierarchical folder structure where things are nested. So you might have a project and then under it, you might have surveys, data, different kinds of things. Um, and then maybe under surveys, you have instrument one, instrument two. Under data, you might have raw data and process data and analyze data. And then your analysis, you might have visualizations. Um, so maybe you have different graphs that you produce for a poster. And otherwise for paper, maybe there are different scales um, because a poster is big and a uh, paper, or maybe one is color and one is in black and white because you can print a poster in color, but you have to pay extra sometimes to have um, color figures in a journal article and then the text of the paper. So a read me file is helpful to tell people what is in each uh, folder. Right. So Naming files, this has probably happened to you if you ever uh, worked on a document with somebody else, right? You can't quite figure out what to name it. Um, so sometimes people say this is the most useful thing <laughs> is the file naming convention. So pick a file naming convention. Um, I would apply this to like, all your files and um, if you ever become sort of the head of a lab, then you can make everybody in your lab <laughs> sort of stick to the same a file naming convention. So it needs to be uh, meaningful. And it's nice, back when I was doing my PhD, we were still hindered by the eight characters. And so you had to be a little bit creative and try to remember what every, all the abbreviations were for. Um, now you don't have that problem. I think it's more like a 254 character limit. Um, so um, you can have different elements um, and you want to use an underscore to sort of separate the different elements. Um, and then you want to use a dash or capitalization um, so then to delimit within, okay? So this here, so these are the different elements. So DST, follow me, and then this date, okay? Um, don't use special characters. Use only one period before the file extension. Um, and then when you're numbering, remember to use leading zeros. Otherwise, your files uh, don't always alphabetize um, correctly. So, and that's also why you want to do your year, 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 month, month, day, day. And if you actually look at um, like the pictures on your phone, you'll notice that all of the dates are done this way. Um, and that's how they that's how you can scroll through and you know what day and what year is, because um, otherwise all your Januarys will end up together. Um, and if you don't lose leading zeros, then October comes after January. So um, year, 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 month, month, day, day. So I do all my files that way. And I convinced the rest of my family that they should do, label all their files with dates that way. Okay. Um, and generally you wanna put your dates either at the end or the beginning. Um, because that's usually what most people are interested in is, is the date. Um, so you generally don't want to put the date in the middle because um, that that's usually will give you the indication of, of what either what day you gather the data. So um, so possible elements. So date and time is a very popular one. Maybe your experiment. So you can either experiment one, two, three, four, five, or maybe you want to be more descriptive, um, control. Um, you know, trial one, or maybe actually say, you know, 50 milligrams, maybe that was sort of what changed in your, in your different trials, um, the sample number um, that you might have collected, maybe it's the instrument, um, the user or the participant or the collector. So um, sometimes there can be systematic error with a particular collector. Um, so especially if you have a lot of undergrads going through um, and maybe they're some of them are sloppier than others, then you might want to make sure that you know the initials of whoever collected the data is always um, in the 
the file the file name, um, the source, the data data type. So it might be your processing step. So um, you have a, a, a bunch of steps um, that are, are being process, processed um, when you're reducing your data. So we talked about raw data and reduced data before. And my recommendation is well, when you're reducing your data and also in your data analysis is to take time slices. So you take your raw data and you lock it down and then you make a copy of your raw data and then you do all your manipulations. You get to a good stopping point, you lock that down, make a copy of it, and then do your next step. Um, so this helps save time. If something goes wrong, you don't have to go back to the very, very beginning. And it also keeps your data safe um, in case something like, yeah, it just keeps your data safe. That you can always go back to your raw data and start from the very beginning and you haven't corrupted your raw data. Um, or accurately deleted your raw data. Um, so, because there's a lot of user error. So, um, processing and analyzing. Um, and so this is when uh, you're going from the raw data to the reduced data to the uh, processed or the analyzed data. So you might have to digitize, transcribe, or translate if you're in the humanities and the social sciences. Um, everybody needs to sort of clean and validate their data. Um, you might need to anonymize if you're using surveys, um, derive data. So sometimes you're measuring data um, indirectly. So if you remember from chemistry, um, PV equals NRT. I don't know why that equation is um, sort of embedded in my mind, but you're usually interested in the number of moles, but you cannot directly calculate that. So you calculate pressure, um, volume, and temperature instead in order to find out how many moles, right? So that's um, deriving your data, sort of uh, manipulating to actually get to the, the unit that you want. Um, and describe and document, 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 document. Make sure you write down what you do in each step. So this is a time saver for you in addition to other, for other people. So, um, in a lot of labs, you have people come in and take over projects. If you don't document, then they have to sort of reinvent the wheel. Even if you started working on a project and then you get really busy teaching and you come back to it six weeks later and you're trying to figure out, okay, where was I? What was I doing? How did I do it? What are these abbreviations? Um, it made sense to you while you were doing it, but you need to go back and uh, make sure the documented that if you came back to your research, you know, two weeks later, six weeks later, a year, six months later, um, even six years later, some re research goes on um, forever that you can still um, use the data or if other people can use the data. Um, and then you analyze and interpret your results and then you produce your research output. So that's sort of the graphs and the tables that you're kind of using. Okay. So, what should you do with your data during the project? Um, so you want multiple backups. Um, nowadays, this is much easier than it used to be because we have uh, cloud storage. So you can put things on Box, you can put things on OneDrive, like that's sort of the way that uh, Baylor IT is going is they're sort of pushing um, OneDrive. Um, I recommend just bookmarking OneDrive on your browser so that you can get to it easily because Otherwise, it's sort of a pain to get to. Um, you can have an external hard drive, especially if you have sensitive data that you don't want on the cloud. Um, people still use flash drives, but just remember that a flash drive in your computer and the same backpack is not a backup because if somebody steals your backup, both of them are gone, right? Um, people used to email uh, copies of, of things to themselves. Um, generally, people don't do that anymore because we do have cloud storage. Um, but also, you know, Make sure you take into account if there's any anonymization, password protection, um, and there is sometimes the need for um, storing your data on an unnetworked computer. All right. Um, so collecting in data, that's, that's what the researchers do. Um, and when we start getting into publishing, sharing, preserving, and reusing data, this is sort of when um, data manage, manager 
managers um, and libraries and archivists and start um, sort of helping a little bit more with the process. Although we can help uh, with some of the other steps. Um, copyright, technically data does not have copyright, but your tables do um, use documentation. So you really need to, how did you get to your data? Um, discovery, so um, how, how are people gonna find your data? And then what kind of access do you want people to get to? So they just wanna know that your data exists um, and maybe a little bit about the data, but maybe not the data files. Maybe there are certain data files that are public and certain ones that um, you will only give to certain people once they've sort of proven that, you know, they're not a harmful entity or that you, they know what to do with the data. Um, and then we need to publish the data and promote the data. Okay. So readme files are very important when you're, um, I guess, archiving or storing your data. Um, so these are text files, so they can be read by any computer. Um, and you can make them at the project level at the data set level and uh, for individual files. It just depends on your need. Um, they need to have consistent formatting. So if you have them for your individual files, they all the information should be the same except for the one thing that's different for each of the files. Um, so that people can sort of easily scan and get the, the information from, from the readme file. And just sort of follow your disciplinary norms so readme files and metadata are slightly different. Um, the descriptive metadata is probably what most researchers need to uh, worry about. Um, there's other sort of technical and um, sort of preservation metadata that librarians use when we're transferring things or putting them into dark um, archives. The readme gives you general information, tells you what each data is in the file, what's in it, tells you how that data was acquired. Um, and sort of data specific information might say this is the date that it was run on, uh, maybe this kind of computer, and then who has access um, and sharing information. But the descriptive met metadata is generally what people use to find your data set. So preserving data. <clears throat> so part of preserving data is migrating the data to the best format or media. Um, storing and backing up, uh, creating a preservation documentation, and then sort of preserving and curating the data. So the curation part is um, where what the re researcher really needs to worry about. The preservation, like what kind of computers we uh, put things on, and whether we have tape backups and how often we back them up. Um, you don't sort of, you don't need to worry about those details. But that's also why we recommend that you put your data into a repository and not just have it on a web page. Um, because um, when it's in a repository, the data is constantly or regularly checked uh, to make sure that there's not what we call bit rot, that where the data, the files become corrupted, um, and nobody really wants people are not going to do that on their their own websites. Um, it also makes it findable. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so when you're preserving files, um, it can be useful to have a thumbnail, which is just sort of a snapshot. So um, you see this with video files um, or sometimes with image files, there'll be like a small version that's very sort of low resolution so that people can sort of get a rough idea of what's in there um, without having to download like the whole video or the whole sort of really large file. Um, and it's also important, especially in your data management plans, sort of the file number and sizes. Um, if you don't have a lot of data, let's say less than, than 10 gig, generally you're not gonna need sort of any special accommodation um, for your data. You might not, you don't need to pay necessarily for extra storage. Um, and so you don't need, and so your funders are gonna want to know about that. Um, when it comes to file number, you know, if you have you know less than 200 files, most people can keep that organized. Um, sometimes, especially if you're doing simulations you're running the same thing thousands of times. And that's just a lot of files. So the file naming convention needs to be really sort of organized so they know like what's different for the different kinds of simulations that you've run. And once the file numbers sort of get to be really um, big, then you just need to make sure that you're organizing them well and that they're um, that you know what's in each one or somebody who wants to go look at it can find the one that they want. Now, when it comes to file types, 
Um, there's non-proprietary. That means any computer can use, can read them. So text files, CSVs, uh, JPEGs, TIFFs, um, and PDFs. Um, there's common proprietary files that most people um, can can read. So these would be like um, Office files, so Word or Excel. Um, SP, SPSS files were, are generally just text files with like certain headers to them. And then um, common pro less common proprietary files like Adobe files. So not everybody um, can read Adobe files except for PDFs because they decided to make that non-proprietary about 20 years ago. Um, and then exclusive files. And that's generally gonna be like GIS files or maybe files uh, that are produced by a particular instrument. And so you wanna make sure that you include information on how to access or also, or maybe if you have a map um, that you produce in ArcGIS that you also download a, a PDF or a picture of it. People won't be able to necessarily reuse it in the same way, but they can decide whether they want to pay the $500 for the program to actually um, read, uh, to actually be able to access your files. Um, so before they shout the money to access something that they might not be able to use or might not be relevant to what their research is on. Um, so where are you gonna store your data? Um, so there's physical data. So do you need special storage? Do you need to pay for special storage? Um, do you have a catalog or a database that sort of tells you what drawer um, each specimen is in? Um, and then um, electronic data. So we have bear docs and bear data and other repositories. So I'm gonna go a little bit into repositories next. So repositories are places where you can deposit information. Um, they're searchable, which is one reason why we like it. Um, there's just something called the FAIR principle, so findable, accessible, interoperable, and uh, reusable. And so repositories, in theory, um, make this easier. <clears throat> they're managed and ma maintained, which means there's uh, regular backups. Um, there's fixity and, and files, so that means we, we check to make sure that the files are not corrupted. And there's um, RE3 RE data, which is the Registry of Research um, data repositories, and you can go to find sort of discipline specific repositories there um, or sort of general repositories. So some of the general repositories you may have heard of are Dryad, Figshare, um, there's the Harvard Dataverse Network, and the Open Science, Open Science Framework and Zenodo. So all of those um, are, I think, have free um, sort of intros uh, for for researchers, um, some of them are more, like if you pay, sometimes you get more features or more space. Um, and then we also have institutional repositories and their docs and their data are two institutional repositories. So bear docs is for documents, bear data is for data. Um, they're um, both, we have them both through the Texas Digital Library. So they, which is nice, so basically they, handle all of the updates to software and um, backups and all of that. Um, Bear docs can, as primary documents, can, but it can accept any kind of file. Bear data is um, primarily data files, so tables, um, but there's some image, audio, and video. Um, both of them are organized by college and department. Um, and Bear docs, you only get a permanent URL, and Bear data, you also get a DOI number. Um, and right now, Bear Docs is mediated deposit, which means you have to submit to the library, and then the library is um, will will put it into Bear Docs for you. Um, there's a couple of departments where there's somebody who's authorized um, to to do that, and we're in the process of making it a little bit less mediated, so that uh, researchers can deposit their own uh, materials into Bear Docs. Um, bare data, once you're trained, which is sort of minimal, um, and then you also control the access. So you can control whether um, people just know the file exists, but they can't download it. Um, generally, the readme should be made open so that everybody can sort of open up the readme and sort of learn more about the data set. Um, then you can either have it sort of closed to everybody or you can have it um, they, where people request and then an automatic email will be generated and you can decide whether this person gets um, access. You can also have it where they have to sign in 
uh, in order to download. So you just keep a track of who's downloaded um, the data, but you don't, you are not requiring them sort of to do any extra steps. Um, there are some uh, limits on data set size um, in their data at this point. Um, I think it's at 10 gig, 100 gig, I don't remember. Um, but we're working on uh, solutions where you might be able to pay if you need more storage. And this is available to anybody um, basically with a, a Baylor email. Um, although if you leave Baylor, if, if, yeah, I'll just show you. <laughs> Okay, um, so you do need to log in, um, but you do need to ask for permission to deposit. So just click here and say, I have an account, can I have permission to deposit? Um, we'll sort of verify that you're um, part of Baylor um, and uh, we'll give you access to your department. So usually for postdocs, um, we can either do two ways. We can either um, make a collection, or basically a folder for um, each project that you're working on, or we can give you a, a folder for yourself, and then you can sort of do um, make sub uh, folders. Uh, so let's see. So Don Hood is a, um, I think he's a postdoc in geology, or he was. I don't know what his status is now. He's been here for a while. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so this is sort of data that he has um, in his in his collection. We usually for postdocs, we also like to have your advisor. Um, and if you look, um, so you can get our citation. Um, you can also get um, before you publish it. You you can get um, a a share button for peer review. So it's anonymized. So as long as your files don't have your name in them, um, then it should be anonymous. So you have to be careful when, you know, if you have an Excel file, there's metadata about the creator and everything. I don't know if anybody would actually bother to look at that, but technically they might be able to figure out who you are if you want double blind peer review. Um, and so there's the citation, you can cite it. And, um, for the contact owner, it'll go to the, the set. So when you if you're actually in the edit mode, let me log in. And I do have admin access to all, everything um, along with the other librarian. Um, so we go to his collection um, and we go to edit, just the general information. Um, there's the email and he has his, like Don Hood, if he's going to stay around, that's fine. A lot of postdocs are only going to be here for three years. So I would recommend using both your Baylor email and a non-Baylor email so that people can still contact you about um, your data afterwards. You can make an account with your non-Baylor email. Um, and just let us know, and then we can sort of add you to um, that email also to sort of Baylor's um, section of the Texas Data Repository. Um, I can do a whole session on this if you want at a, at a different time. Okay, let's go back to my... Um, so reusing data. Um, so what would you reuse data for? Um, conduct secondary analysis. Um, there's a lot of um, replication studies in psychology. Um, that's sort of a big thing. Um, undertake follow-up research, because a lot of times you just looked at one, you collect more data than you actually need. Um, also, sometimes some people's, I always say that some people's noise is other people's data. Uh, so you might not be interested, but somebody else might be interested. Um, scrutinize findings, and then you might also want to use um, the data for teaching and learning purposes. 
Um, there's a number of mandates about publicly accessible um, data. So the one that came out in the 2013, and then one that came out in 2014, and then the newest one that came out in 2022. Um, and they have, I think, like once the Holden's minimum, they, they have sort of uh, names for them. Um, if you want to see data management plan mandates from different funders, um, this is sort of a, it's a couple years old, but uh, it's just, it gives the, the mandates for these um, U.S. federally funded agencies. That is it. So thank you very much. Do any of you guys have questions? Yeah. Uh this is really interesting. I'm uh, that data management plan tool. I'm just thinking about what must life have been like before that existed to have to gather all that information and put it together without having a tool like that to to collate it for. Right. You. So yeah, we just would people would type stuff up and they would send to us and we would read it up. So this was you know this was more than ten years ago um, when that happened. And um, at that point, OBPR would actually send out an email to everybody. Who was submitting saying don't forget to send your data management plan to the libraries and we actually got pretty good uptake yeah. i think now people are a little bit more familiar with data management plans so we don't get as many reviews so we got a lot last year uh, with the new nih um so mandate um we you know I'm like oh i turned it in and i didn't know i had to write a data management plan I, they never made me do this before i'm like they made this announcement two years ago that they were going to start implementing it with the button. That's okay. I will read it for you and get it back to you tomorrow. So there was a, a bit of a flurry. So when reviewers are looking at data management plans, what are they looking for? Like, what are things that are that make them happy when they see them? And are there things that are a red flag if they see this in a data management plan that's a negative? <clears throat> so if they... Okay, I would say in the past let's say seven, eight years ago, um, you could be rejected for an insufficient data management plan, or they were picking between two that were, two projects that were comparable, the one with the data, better data management plan would more likely get the grant. I mean, there's lots of different sure. factors on, on how they um, decide who gets grants. Um, so I think they're, one thing is they wanna make sure that what you put in actually makes sense with what you said you're going to do. Like you didn't just take somebody else's and and try to make yours fit theirs. Um, so it should be unique. They, like I said before, they are you okay with um, the, the, they are okay with, you know, boilerplates for things like, you know, describing your repository. Cause you know, it's not gonna change. It's not gonna change. Um, so they want to make sure that there's preservation. There's um, that you are like if you're not sharing your data, that you have a good reason why you're not sharing data. Um, they are not expecting you to share your raw data. They are expecting you to share at least your analyzed data. Um, and I think most of them would prefer you to to share your reduced data if possible. But there's some sometimes legitimate reasons why you shouldn't. But you just have to put down those legitimate reasons. So they want to make sure that you've thought through it. I think that's that's the most important part um, and that you think it's important. Uh, I'm waiting for the first example, which I think should be coming soon, um, of a grant being rejected because you did not follow through on your past data management plan. Like you said, you were going to deposit it someplace and they can't find it anywhere. So they're not gonna believe you that you're gonna do it this time. Mm -hmm. um, I think that is about to happen. And especially with all of the, since everything's connected to each other, they're built very much more quickly. So when you you know put data into a repository, you say what grant number it is. And if there's a grant ID, they should be able to search for that grant ID and if they can't find it anywhere in all of the, the major repositories, or especially where you said you were going to put it, then they might not give you your next grant. I think that's coming up. Um, I don't think it's happened yet, but as soon as the first case happens, 
and it will scare everybody silly. So they just need one example. Somebody has to be the scapegoat for that. Yeah. I mean, they'll probably, you know, let you correct it and then. It's still uh, worth paying attention to. Yes. All right. Well, Christina, thank you so much. And uh, I'll go ahead and end the Zoom meeting. We'll have this up on the website so folks can uh, can get this up on our YouTube channel. Uh, but we really appreciate you coming and sharing with us. My pleasure. All right.